So let's get started with um, our second plenary panel, National Security Whistleblowers, Exposing Severe Wrongdoing in a Culture of Secrecy. Uh, Kathleen McKellen, but start us off. Good morning. We rely on national security whistleblowers to bring to light some of the most serious misconduct, massive taxpayer waste, illegal domestic surveillance, torture. We need national security whistleblowers. The public has very little access to information about our intelligence community. There are national security exemptions to open government laws. In the national security context, whistleblowers are often the public's only source of information. But despite the importance of their disclosures, national security whistleblowers have no meaningful legal protection. The existing internal channels are ineffective and often fail miserably at protecting whistleblowers from retaliation. National security whistleblowers, meanwhile, operate in a culture of ever-expanding secrecy. They must navigate a broken classification system plagued by rampant overclassification in order to make their disclosures. Then, when national security employees do make disclosures, agencies turn the secrecy regime against whistleblowers by revoking a whistleblower's security clearance, as you heard on the earlier panel, by accusing the whistleblower himself or herself of being a danger to national security, or, as we heard from Thomas Drake earlier, through criminal investigation and prosecution for alleged mishandling of supposedly secret information. So we've got a great group of experts who are going to solve all of these problems <laughs> here today. Um, they work day and night on it. Uh, their full biographies are available in the packet, so I'm going to give them brief introductions that will do no justice really to their qualifications, but will hopefully leave time at the end of the discussion for questions. Michael German is policy counsel with the American Civil Liberties Union. Prior to joining the ACLU, he served 16 years as a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, where he specialized in domestic terrorism and covert operations. He also experienced firsthand what it was like to blow the whistle in the intelligence community when he reported improprieties in a counterterrorism case. Jesslyn Radak is the National Security and Human Rights Director at the Government Accountability Project, where she headed the team at GAP that represented keynote speaker Tom Drake. She's also a former Justice Department attorney where she specialized in legal ethics and a whistleblower in the case of American Taliban, John Walker Lynn. Stephen Aftergood is a senior research analyst at the Federation of American Scientists where he directs the project on government secrecy. He also writes the widely read and respected blog and newsletter, Secrecy News, which reports on developments in secrecy policy and provides public access to official records of policy value. So let's start with Mike German. Mike, uh, can you describe a bit about the secrecy regime national security whistleblowers must navigate? How does the classification system impact national security and maybe more broadly our system of democracy and why does that matter for whistleblowers? Great. Thank you very much, Kathleen, and thanks to GAP and to the Mod House for uh, inviting me uh, uh, and putting together this panel. Um, you know, probably uh, far more eloquent uh, than I could be was James Madison who said, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and the people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. You know, quite simply, government secrecy is simply incompatible with democracy. And you know, we cannot, as James Madison said, be the governors of ourselves if the government is allowed to engage in activities that the public's not able to become aware of. And while we all recognize the need to protect a certain limited number of, of secrets for national security purposes, we have to remember that that is, is a, a necessary evil and that it should, you know, whatever secrets are necessary should be kept for a very, sh should be few and should be kept for a very short period of time. Uh, unfortunately, what we have since the creation of the national security establishment that we currently uh, have in this country uh, is that it has been growing unburdened since it was created after World War II. And it's interesting, um, uh, about 10 years after it was created, uh, the government put together a commission to study how effective it was. And what it found was that the government was class classifying far too much information far too much of the wrong information that this undermined uh, people's confidence in the system and uh, compelled them to leak information in order uh, to, to have it function so that it, the system itself 
uh, was not protecting the secrets that it needed and was actually doing harm to our security. And about every 10 years, the government has done another study uh, which says exactly the same thing, basically, except that the problem is now worse because it's grown. And uh, the last one was in 1998, the Moynihan Commission, uh, and they uh, issued a number of recommendations, uh, almost none of which have been followed. <laughs> and we uh, now have what the Washington Post called Top Secret America. And if you haven't followed this series, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's online. There are a number of different stories. But according to their reporting, there are now 1,271 government agencies and 1,931 private companies that are working on counterterrorism or homeland security or defense work. So this has become a huge part of our government. Uh, the Government Accountability Office uh, determined that th there are at least 2.4 million people in this country with security clearances at, at at least the uh, um, confidential level. So, you know, this is no small workforce. This is a huge amount of, of the, the federal workforce and often working on the most important issues, national security, defense, intelligence, and law enforcement. And, you know, you've got uh, some flavor of, of what difficulties uh, are faced when you have conscientious employees within these agencies uh, try and come forward with the truth. When, when Tom Drake spoke to you earlier, and uh, Tony Schaefer um, and, and Peter as well, uh, about how difficult it is trying to navigate what is your constitutional duty and the oath that you take to protect and defend the Constitution within a system that is going to punish you for giving information to the wrong people, even within the classified setting. Uh, you know, in my case in the FBI, literally they tried to, to um, suggest that, that whistle, the little whistleblower protection coverage that did exist in the FBI shouldn't apply because I told my assistant special agent in charge about the problem rather than the special agent in charge, and that I would only be protected if I had told the special agent in charge, even though that the way the, the law enforcement system works within the FBI, there, there's no way my special agent in charge ever would have met with me. They don't meet with every agent who says they have a problem. You have to go through the assistant special agent in charge. So, you know, it was sort of a system set up to fail. Um, and, you know, especially going outside to inspectors general, as, uh, as um, Tom discussed, uh, can be fraught with peril. And there's nobody really there who, who once you've made this complaint, and particularly when you brought it outside of the agency, uh, it, whose job it is to protect you. Um, so it's you know, critically important that we make sure that, uh, that the agencies themselves uh, have some uh, are compelled to protect whistleblowers, and you know we're we're hopeful. Uh, the national security aspect of the, the Whistleblower Protection Act has been one of the most difficult because, of course, we are dealing with information uh, that's highly classified at times, or even just sensitive, um, but can damage uh, law enforcement investigations or other things if it comes out. So Congress is very uh, wary of giving full protection to the national security community. Uh, and that works to our detriment, because if Congress can't get the information they need, uh, certainly they can't do the oversight that we expect them to do as citizens of this country. And we put out a report, uh, the ACLU put out a report uh, called Drastic Measures Required that talks about the expanding secrecy regime and what Congress needs to do to, uh, to fully uh, en enable their power in the national security realm. Um, you know, this is not just an executive branch issue. Uh, Congress has full responsibility over the national security establishment, just as it does over other aspects of our government. And they have the tools under the Constitution uh, to do the work that they need to do to make sure that these powers are not being abused uh, and are being used effectively. And I think that's something that, that came out when, when Tony and Peter and Tom were talking. Uh, the frustration that you feel within uh, the national security establishment and you're reporting wrongdoing that, that not only violates rights but also harms our security. 
and you know, for the, for the conscientious employees of this community that are trying to uh, do their duty uh, and do it within the, the, the limits placed by the Constitution, uh, it's very frustrating because while you know, oftentimes in, in discussing national security work, they talk about a balancing between civil liberties and security. Uh, what I found uh, is that they actually work hand in glove, and that if you're working to, to follow the law and protect the innocent, uh, that helps you focus on the people who are truly a threat. And if we could put all these resources uh, that, that Top Secret America talked about towards uh, chasing the, the few bad people that are out there, uh, we'd be far more effective at, at finding them rather than treating every American as a suspect, uh, which unfortunately they, they seem to be doing now. Um, so I appreciate it if you pick up a copy of the report there over here, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thanks, Mike. So uh, let's go to Jesslyn. Can you talk a little bit about the retaliation national security whistleblowers face? How is the secrecy regime used against whistleblowers, and does this broken classification system make it more difficult to protect whistleblowers from retaliation? Well, I, I thought it was a problem during the Bush administration, which saw the the birth of some 160 hybrid classification categories, including sensitive but unclassified, sensitive security information for official use only, classified. I mean, you, you come up with the, the, the combination. Uh, I mean, it, it just everything um, being stamped classified in some kind of way suddenly made it a minefield for whistleblowers to disclose information. Now, I had disclosed information um, in the American Taliban case that the judge had specifically ruled not classified. So it was dealt with in a different way by slapping me with a gag order that I'm still under today. So there are certain words that you all may use freely that I'm not allowed to say. Um, in terms of classification being used against whistleblowers, I think Thomas Drake's case is exhibit A for classification run amok. Um, he was charged under um, the Espionage Act. Five of the 10 felony counts he faced were Espionage Act counts for allegedly mishandling, allegedly classified information. And just that allegation alone alienated a lot of people, even in this community, from coming anywhere near him because, oh, well, if he disclosed classified, we cannot support him. Well, after all was said and done, and after the government's case collapsed under the weight of the truth, it turned out that the first two counts were based on information deemed to be classified by the government. All five espionage counts dealt with classified information. But the information was predicated on documents seized from Mr. Drake's house that were only deemed to be classified after they were taken from his home. It's not like they were stamped classified and removed from his home. We, have, we don't have ex post facto laws in this country for a reason, because that's exactly what they did. The first two counts of, in the espionage counts were based on documents that had been published to thousands on NSA net, which is the NSA's internal intranet. It was not revealed to him for eight months into the prosecution pretrial proceedings that one of those documents was officially marked unclassified. Another one had been improperly classified during the classification review, but then declassified three months into the proceedings. But again, he was not told for, for months, even though that was exculpatory. So we have these intra intranet documents. And then we have three more classification, alleged classification counts under the espionage, which consisted of 
protected disclosures that he made to the Department of Defense Inspector General, which is authorized to receive classified information, as are the Senate and House Intelligence Committees, to whom he also made disclosures. But again, he was always scrupulously careful between knowing not to disclose classified information, and contrary to the government's meme that he leaked classified information, he never leaked classified information to a reporter, and he was not charged with that. But still, it was enough to paint him as an enemy of the state, to paint a whistleblower with that label. Um, and I remember in my own case being called a traitor and a turncoat and a terrorist sympathizer makes you radioactive. But to use that kind of prosecution under the Espionage Act is particularly insidious. Um, it's also problematic because the word classification was not even being used until decades and decades after the Espionage Act had been written. Um, so again, I see we have had a number of whistleblowers who have made disclosures that have later been deemed to be sensitive, but unclassified, but secret. And for official use only, but unclassified, and all other kinds of mischief. And it's a real way, basically, it's kind of the, the throw down the mantle of classification and no one's gonna argue with it, or they can't argue with it. It becomes very difficult to make the case that something is not classified. Um, so it's a way to impede people from bringing forth information that the public needs to know about. In Thomas Drake's case, it was so egregious that the classification czar under George W. Bush, William Leonard, after the Drake case collapsed, ended up filing a lawsuit saying, you need to punish whoever it was who improperly, so grossly improperly classified the information at the heart of his case. And I applaud him for coming forward because he is also, by doing that, a whistleblower. And he came out of retirement to serve as a defense witness in Drake's case, Drake was indicted under the Obama administration, but initially investigated under the Bush administration. Um, so the, again, I, I'm tired of seeing whistleblowers get caught up in this faux classification regime. Um, when I've been told by people who have actually been official classification authorities, oh yeah, I could classify my kid's baby announcement if I feel like it. Well, that's not okay. That's not the purpose of the classification system. And when we classify everything, it's the equivalent of having nothing classified. If you classify everything, and people need to do that out of their own interest of feeling self-important, because if I have a document, but then I stamp it classified, I make it secret, and somehow its value goes up, that is not a reason to classify something. It's not that certain things shouldn't be classified, and I don't want to get slapped down with a, you think everything should be open. No, I think nuclear design information and troop movements and intelligence identities and things like that should be classified. So I don't want anyone to say that we're up here saying nothing deserves to be secret. But when you make everything secret, then nothing is really secret. Thanks, Jess. So um, now the hardest question is for Steve. Uh, so what needs to be done so that the government cannot use this classification system to hide embarrassing or illegal behavior? And what reforms are available to protect whistleblowers and to alleviate some of uh, this excessive secrecy? Well, that really is the question. What, what can be done? Uh, let me say first that um, uh, I know many of you in the audience, some of my co-panelists, have experienced the national security secrecy system uh, on your own body and soul, and uh, you have my respect. I'm basically an observer and a student of the system, um, not myself a whistleblower, but I'm someone who spends time trying to understand how this system works 
and uh, what can be done to make it uh, more accountable and, and to work more in accordance with its intended purposes. If the question is, is there a way that we can free ourselves of this legacy of secrecy um, in a fundamental way, I'm afraid the answer is I don't know. I'm not sure that there is. Um, it is possible to make real, discrete changes in secrecy policy. This time, for the first time ever, the director, this year for the first time ever, the director of national intelligence uh, disclosed the amount of uh, the intelligence budget that's being requested for next year, for fiscal 2012. That is something that has never happened before. Uh, Ten years ago, I filed a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit requesting that information, and the director of central intelligence at the time, George Tennant, said, oh no, that information cannot be disclosed. If it were disclosed, it would damage national security. Um, I lost that lawsuit, and that information remained classified. This year, the DNI is disclosing it voluntarily. So it is possible to make a radical transition from you absolutely cannot have that information to of course you can have that information. And I think it's worth pondering what exactly are the conditions that make such a reversal possible. Um, I'm not going to ponder that right now, but it's a, it's a question worth thinking about. Um, but if the question is, is it possible to make systematic changes across the board um, it hasn't been up to now, and uh, we don't really know. I would like to call your attention to a couple of initiatives that are underway right now that really are geared towards systematic reform and that have not failed yet. <laughs> so that's my gesture at, at optimism. Um, in his 2009 executive order on classification, President Clinton mandated what's called a fundamental classification guidance review. It was an instruction to all classifying agencies to review each and every one of their classification guidance manuals, their classification instructions, and to look for things that were obsolete or unnecessary and to eliminate them. The sort of model for this activity was the Department of Energy's Fundamental Classification Policy Review, which was conducted in the 1990s, and which led to the elimination of hundreds of categories of classified information that ceased to be classified. Um, in the case of the Obama procedure, um, agencies are supposed to complete the first cycle of review by next June. So far, we've seen very little progress um, towards any kind of fundamental change, but um, the clock is still ticking, the process is not over yet, and one of the things my organization is trying to do is to light fires around different agencies and at the White House and say, you know, we're nine months away from the deadline for this process, can we move a little faster, can we go a little more quickly, can we have something to show for it at the end of this process? Another attempt at systematic reform that's worth being aware of, last year um, Congress enacted and the President signed into law something called the Reducing Overclassification Act. Um, most of the provisions are really geared towards promoting information sharing among government agencies and not to, and are not targeted at reducing overclassification. One of them, though, um, tasks the inspectors general of all classifying agencies <laughs> to do a review of agency classification performance and to um, verify that agencies are complying with the executive order that regulates classification. Uh, and to find out if they're not, why not, and what can be done about that. Uh, again, not a lot of headway has been made on that score, but it is, you know, something that is in process now and that um, at least holds out a chance of um, 
bringing about some measure of systematic reform. If neither of those or other initiatives prove to be successful, then we're really stuck with the, you know, one item at a time, one issue at a time, piece by piece, uh, piecemeal uh, approach to secrecy reform, which is certainly the, the hard way and the long way to go about it, um, but uh, um, that's our fallback position if we can't do better. So why don't I leave it there and... Great, thanks Steve. Um, and this is a question sort of for anybody on the panel, which you know is, is something that um, I've been asked in the past by people who don't work on these issues, which is, isn't it prohibited to classify embarrassing or illegal behavior? And so why does that keep happening? Because isn't it technically not okay to classify that kind of stuff? Um, unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, I believe it's section 1.7 of the President's executive order, which is captioned limitations on classification, says that under no circumstances shall information be classified in order to prevent embarrassment or to conceal um, uh, violations of law and so forth. The difficulty with that provision is the words in order to. Uh, it doesn't say that the classification that covers up criminal activity is invalid. That's not what it says. It says that you may not classify in order to uh, cover up criminal activity. And that language has been interpreted by the executive branch and also um, has been, um, that interpretation has been ratified uh, in court by Judge Lambert to mean that what's prohibited is not classifying violations of law, what's prohibited is classifying with the deliberate purpose in mind of concealing criminal activity. And of course, that's all but a meaningless prohibition because it, it, it doesn't concern classification, it concerns the mental state of the classifier. And so it cannot be enforced, and indeed it never has been enforced. Um, so what can you say? You can say that a meaningful reform of the classification system, whether in an executive order or in statute, would be that no classification that conceals criminal activity is valid. We don't care if you classified it in order to conceal or for some other reason. If by order or by statute you were to say that criminal activity cannot be classified and if you do classify it, that's invalid, then that would be a meaningful change to current classification policy. You know, and let me just add one thing to that. And first of all, let me also say that Steve Aftergood is far too humble. Uh, if you don't follow secrecy news, uh, you're, you're really missing out. He's really one of uh, our nation's treasures here in DC. He knows secrecy policy, uh, I think, better than anybody on the planet. So uh, please uh, do subscribe to uh, their newsletter. Um, but also in, in, in the why can they, it, is that they control it. You know, they shouldn't be able to, but they do. So I, I think you heard a little bit when, when Tom spoke and when Tony spoke, and you know, it's certainly true with me as well, that we can't tell you the whole story. <laughs> I mean, even now when we can tell you parts of the story, we can't tell you the whole story. And that, you know, like James Madison says, you know, knowledge will always go govern ignorance. They can control what is coming out into the media. And they can also leak what they want to leak. So, you know, by selectively leaking certain information where, of course, there are no investigations of those kind of leaks, the kind of leaks that tend to promote the policy that the government is trying to establish. You know, one of the big things we cover in our report is when President Obama was uh, deliberating what to do about Afghanistan and the leak of the McChrystal report came out about, you know, his belief that they needed at least 30,000 more troops. Uh, Robert Gates was asked, the Secretary of Defense, you know, what are you doing to find who leaked that report? And he said, I don't think it's important to, to look back. 
on relief to report. Of course, that promoted the, the policy that the DOD wanted to employ, so that leak is fine. And of course, we have uh, you know all sorts of leaks that happen in the newspaper every day, and uh, you know those again aren't investigated. The people who are putting them forward aren't persecuted the way people who are whistleblowers who are reporting government misconduct and exposing this embarrassment is. So it's a huge part of the problem. And what we really need to have is far more effective whistleblower laws to protect the agents who are actually telling the truth. Thanks. And I have one other question, which is another one that I've also been asked by people who don't work on this issue, which is, what about the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act? Why is that not enough to protect intelligence community whistleblowers? Um, like the Whistleblower Protection Act, it doesn't have any kind of enforcement mechanism. Um, and like, unlike the Whistleblower Protection Act, though, it doesn't even prohibit anything, at least on paper, in terms of retaliation. It's more of a plan or a prescription of how intelligence community officials should blow the whistle. And for example, when Thomas Drake did go to um, Senate and House intelligence committees, he was doing so under the authority of the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act. But it also has, I mean, it doesn't really help in any kind of other way. Um, and it actually puts up roadblocks um, some of which are like, uh, or I mean, if, if it doesn't put up road, roadblocks, people use it as a basis. Agencies will use it as a basis to put up a roadblock that they're not really authorized to. Like, well, before you go to Congress, you have to clear it with the agency spokesperson. Well, if you're going to Congress to complain about the agency over which Congress has oversight, then obviously, it defeats the purpose if you have to clear that contact initially with you with someone in the agency. Um, so it you know it, like the Whistleblower Protection Act is more of a paper tiger. It doesn't really do that much. And to the extent that national security and intelligence agency employees are not included under the rubric of the regular Whistleblower Protection Act, that is also something that needs to be reformed. <coughs> 